Well, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study, where not only do we teach the word, but we demonstrate it. That was that was fun. That now, can't you imagine now? Doesn't it make a little more sense how people thought back when the first baptism of the Holy Ghost that they were all drunk? Because I look back at that video, and it's the last time I will look back at it. Because that's some crazy things. But you know what? I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not sure I've ever felt it that strong my whole entire life. It was just, it was just good. And, and it was crazy looking. All right, so uh, if you need a sheet, if you'll raise your hand. If you need a Bible, if you'll raise both hands. Are we settled? All right, tonight we're going to finish in 1 Timothy 5. We're going to finish 17, uh, Scripture 17 through 25. So I'll real quick do uh, a review of what happened before. This time I remember it. Uh, the first part of chapter 5 revealed the qualifications of a real widow and that the family was responsible as repayment to take care of her. If the woman is a true widow, then there are funds within the church to take care of her. And then the rest of chapter 5 will cover the treatment of the elders, the pastors, the bishops. The elders are not just the old people in the Bible. They're the, uh, are in the church. They are the people that have been set up to run the church. Uh, the ones that uh, lay the doctrine down, like what is it we're going to teach? What, what from the word are we going to present? Um, they set up the, the pastors. All these are elders. And if you remember two or three chapters ago, it actually gave qualifications for who could be an elder. And so you had to have, you had to meet all those qualifications. So these elders have already been vetted, vetted and uh, they know exactly, if they're, if they're uh, um, an elder, then they're in the proper place. Everybody knows that they stand alone, that they stand strong. So tonight is really going to give us a description of how they are to be treated, paid, and so on. So we are talking about elders. Elders are pastors. Elders are bishops over many churches. That's what the I think a lot of translations say bishop. Some even miss, do it wrong and say they're deacons, but these not. These are elders. Elders run the church, run the doctrine, and, um, and preach and teach. So let's see what the Word of God says about them. Uh, we're in verse 17, 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now the word, um, the word honor here in, in the beginning of, verse seven, of 17 is actually the Greek word to me, which means a valuing by which the prices is fixed or wages. So this is talking about money, and you'll see it'll make it a little clearer. And it's saying, let the elder who rule well... Not the ones that rule bad, because there are elders that do not rule well. These are the ones that rule well, should be counted worthy of double pay. Not only just in honor and a sense of respect, but also in pray. And he said, especially those who labor in the word and the doctrine. <clears throat> it goes on in verse 18, says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox white treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of its wages. So Paul gives two examples of what he's talking about. He says, Let the elders who rule well be counted double, uh, be given uh, double um, wages, especially those that teach and labor in the word. I mean, there are many... Um, places for you to work in and in the church. You have administrators, you have people that do, you know, uh, yard stuff, maintenance and all that. So there's plenty of them that, that, that should be uh, given money, should be paid for their, for their work that they do. But he's talking here just about the elders, that they should be paid double wages because they do, in God's eyes, a very worthy thing. And that is teach the doctrine and teach the word. The doctrine basically is just, it's, it's almost the same thing as what it is, the doctrine in the Word. But he's saying they should be treated fairly. And then he goes on and he says, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the, get the uh, grain. Let's see. Uh, this is from Deuteronomy 25.4. What this is is, is is back then, and actually I saw a video whatever the day. Some countries still do this. They will take an ox, you put the wheat or the grain all on the ground uh, just from having it pulled, and then the, the, the ox just go in circle and circle. They just keep going, and what they're doing is they're separating the grain from all the uh, chaff, all the junk. 
And so what you do later is you just kind of fan all the uh, leftovers and you have your, your uh, grain. And what he's saying is, is don't put a muzzle on that ox because his ox's pay is the grain that he's, he's not going to eat it all, but he, he desires, he should be. He's working hard, this ox is, in order, he's, he's, he's making his wages, let's put it that way. So he says, don't muzzle him so he can't have it. And he's making reference to the elders. And he's saying, look, so many people have this attitude that pastors and, and people that work in the church should not be paid whatsoever, that they should just live off of the grace of God. And this is not what the Word says. The Word says if they, if they work well, if they work good, then they should be paid. It goes on to say, now this is the Word. This is not a saying this. It goes on to say in Luke 10, 7, he gives another example. He said, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And here Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he told them not to provide money for themselves and not to go from house to house as beggars because the laborer is worthy of his hire. He was teaching them that when you go to these places and teaching, and teaching, don't go and look at it or don't teach even that it's pity money. You know, that you, know, you feel sorry for them or whatever. You know, here's you some money to just get you by. He says, no, when you go and you work and you teach and you labor, because I'm telling you, pastors work. They do not all go play golf or tennis or any other things. It's work. And God's idea, in God's word, I've read, it, I've read it several times, is that a pastor, most of his time should be devoted to praying and, and getting revelation from the Lord and from working. And the Lord says, if you work, then you should be paid. And he, he's saying that to his disciples. He says, don't go out there and act like, you know, if you just can you give me some money? Can you get, I'm starving. No, he says, you go out there, you perform what you're supposed to do, you teach, you pray, you minister to these people, and then they should give you work. I mean, what if you, <laughs> you went to work for a week and then thought, you know, went to your boss and said, hey, you know, I mean, can I have a little something? You know, no, you get paid. You work, you get paid. It's the same way inside the ministry. And that is so messed up now. People, I, can, I heard a guy the other day actually that was upset because he said his pastor uh, made more money than he did. He was upset about that. I can remember also a time we were in a church where uh, the, there was a new pastor coming in and he wanted a truck. He was, part of his package was that he got a car and he wanted a truck because he just thought he could use a truck. They, the board wouldn't give it to him. They wouldn't give it to him. Same price, they just didn't want their pastor riding around in a truck. But, but he wants a truck. See, they had the wrong mindset. You, you treat your pastors, you treat your bishops, you treat them with honor and respect because they are God's people. It's like saying it to God, basically what is what it is. So they shouldn't look at others' support as pity, but as payment. And, 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 and pastors, if they do a good work, if they do a good work, should be compensated. Verse 19, glad I'm over that. Uh, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. The elders, remember already a couple chapters, have been uh, proven worthy. They had a criteria that they had to be. But I'm telling you, the devil loves to attack pastors. That's the why the word also says that pastors and, and elders and all should be above reproach, way above reproach, because the devil is looking to take them down. It happens every day. It happens all the time. That's why we have to be even further above reproach. And that's what the devil does. The devil will come after them. And what he's saying is when they do come after these elders, these elders have been vetted, that they, they meet all the qualifications, they were strong men. He's telling Timothy, Paul's saying, look, don't take everybody's word. If somebody comes up and says, hey, this, this elder is stealing, or this elder, I saw him in a bar, or whatever, don't just take it at face value. You need to research it. You need to actually have two to three witnesses to validate that. And you, can't, you might say, well, there won't be anything. Trust me. There'll be, if, if this guy is sinning, this elder is sinning, then he will have, he will leave a trail that you will be able to find. But he said, don't take all these accusations. Don't spend your time chasing them down because they need to be vetted. They need to have two or three witnesses. In fact, the Bible actually says in Deuteronomy 19, 15, he said this of everybody. He said, a single witness shall not rise up against a man 
on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So be very quick, quick or be very careful before you throw something out there against somebody within the church, against anybody. You better make sure you know what you're talking about and you need some witnesses to come along with you to, to verify that what you say are true. You know what? You really just need to be careful in that avenue altogether. You know, the, the Lord will reveal it. There's nothing that is hiding that God won't reveal. So it's a good rule to live by. See, um, however, however, if it is established that an elder is unrepentant, continuing sin, he is to be rebuked in front of the church. Woo. So if they go to him and he is still sinning, they prove that he's sinning, he will, not, he will not quit, he will not repent, then you bring him before the church and you rebuke him. That, that would put an end to a lot of stuff. Just saying. We call your name and go, hey. You know what? Though, you know what? In this society, that is so frowned on. It's almost like you don't want to hurt the criminal or the person that is sinning. Oh, don't hurt his feelings. Don't humiliate him. Look, if you, we would humiliate him, then other people would go, I'm going up there. I ain't doing that because they're going to bring me up from the church and this is going to be, uh, everybody's going to know about it. But see, people like their sins hidden. It's easier. But if we did like the Bible says, everybody, you see sweat coming down. Um, then, then we would bring you before and we'd go, here you go. Verse 21. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, the, you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Now, if I look at the very beginning, it says, I charge you before God the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. And when I read that, I thought, elect angels, that's kind of a weird wording. Uh, actually, the Greek word for this means uh, select by implication or favorite. So it's talking about the good angels. You know, there are bad angels, which are demons, and there are good angels. So he's not talking about the bad angels, but he's saying before God, before Jesus, and the elect angels, the favorite angels, the good angels, you must observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. In other words, if somebody is sinning, and this is, is true for anybody, if somebody is sinning that is in, uh, uh, in the ministry, whatever, you can't, just because it's a good friend of yours, just because it's a family member of yours, they are not to be shown partiality. Everybody is to be, to be treated as if you were standing right in front of God, right there yourself. Everybody has to, you have to do it without partiality or it's not effective. So he says, before all this, you know what, I wanted to, real quick, I'm, I've got the sheets up here and I'll put them out in the back. Uh, this is kind of a short chapter, so I wanted to just talk to you real quick, just kind of like a, a small commercial about angels. Because it's talking about elect angels, it's talking about the good angels. And although a lot of people know there's angels and there's demons, there are a lot of things that you don't know about angels. So I'm not going to go into all the scripture because I've listed them here on the sheet. And I'll put them right down here and you can come get them if you want to... Um, Study them, but I'll just give you a little information. Angels are personal spirit beings who have intelligence, emotions, and will. This is true of both the good and the evil angels, which are demons. Angels possess intelligence. They show emotion. Uh, angels are spirit beings with true, without true physical bodies, although they do have physical bodies. Although they do not have physical bodies, they are still personalities. I'm not going to read the rest of this. So I'm going to leave this. It just gives you an information on angels and what part they played. I just thought it was the best time. I had this, this, this sheet that I had uh, put together a while ago. So I thought, well, this is the greatest time since this is sort of a short chapter for you to know about it. Because angels are there. I will tell you this. I was looking. I, the reason I started all this was to see if maybe there are um, guardian angels. Everybody, I keep hearing it over and over that everybody has a guardian angel, but I can't find it anywhere in Scripture. There's only one time where Jesus talks about children, and he says that there are angels in, 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 in heaven that are watching 
over every single child. So I know children are protected. Maybe even they each have their own guardian angel. But it doesn't say anywhere in the scripture where we do. It does say the angels are ministering spirits, that they are to protect and watch over us. But as far as each one of us having a particular guardian angel, I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying they don't. I'm not saying they do. I'm just saying scripturally, I, I can't find it. I've often laughed and said that if um, you've ever ridden in the car with Pastor Mike, that his guardian angels are exhausted. <laughs> there are many of them, many of them, many of them. So a pastor is supposed to be God's ambassador in the church, making decisions as God would. 22. Do not lay on hands, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. One way of laying on hands is used to separate an individual into the ministry. If they a person is ordained or a couple is ordained, then one of the things that you do as a ministry is you lay hands on them. And when you do that, it is you, it is is the spirit of God in you, and you are transferring that spirit onto that person. And what this scripture says is don't do it too quick. Let these people mature. Let it play out. Watch how they are. Because if you lay hands on somebody in order to send them off into the ministry, then if they do something wicked down the way, then it's on your hands. You have to be careful. You have, it's the same way when we say don't let anybody lay hands on you when they pray for you. I mean, we pray for you, but we don't allow other people that we don't know to come up front and lay hands on you because it is a spiritual tra transference. Uh, that Spirit of God that's in me is going to go and rest on you. Last week, I'll give you an example. When I was praying for people, it's never happened to me before. But I'm telling you, I, I was, it, it was so strong that went, before I even got to somebody, that Spirit it was like it would just go, whoo, and then everything would come out. And I would say a particular thing. And, then, and, and it was like reading somebody's mail. And then I'd go to the next one, and it'd be totally, totally different. And then I would lay hands on them. That was the Holy Ghost transferring onto you. That's why when you come and you lay hands on somebody, they start shaking or maybe they can't even stand up. It's because that spirit that's in you that has been flowing through you into that person and that's why they're, they're shaking and they're, and they're weak and, they're, and sometimes they even fall on the ground. You know you don't have to fall on the ground. Just letting you know that Pentecostal 101, everybody thinks that they're being prayed where they have to lay. No, you do not. Only time you have to lay down is if, or, or fall down is if you can't stand up. This, just that simple. Sometimes it's really good because you are getting a transference of power to your body. Sometimes it's like an operating table. You know, the Spirit of God goes in you and you just lay down there and wait. Maybe He'll speak to you. Maybe He's healing your body. I don't know what it is. But know that you do not have to lay down. You do not have to fall down. And there is no power in those little black claws we put over you. All they are, I had that acid. All they are is just to keep you modest. They're modest. Yeah, thank you for that. Just to be modest. Just so that when you lay down and you're on God's operating table, that you don't have to worry about anything, especially if you have a dress or whatever. So I've had people say, what, what's the power in the, <laughs> in the black claws? And I'm going, there is no power. We're just covering you up. Um, so be careful. It says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. In other words, you're, not, you're going to get in trouble if you lay on hands and, and, and these people go out and do something um, wicked. Verse 23, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So there it is. There is a scripture that anybody that wants to drink that is a Christian, go to. Just mark it down. They go, see, Paul told Timothy to drink. No, he did not take it. You have to think. But people sometimes I want to go, just be common sense. Why is he telling him to put a little wine into his water? Because he's having stomach problems. It's medicine. It would be like if you went into surgery and the doctor come in. I don't know, maybe you had something done to your shoulder or whatever. And you come in, come out, and you're in a lot of pain. And he, he gives you oxycodone. I don't know how many people get hooked on that. But there are many, many drug addicts on oxycodone. It's a dangerous drug. But not if you take it in the first day or two for pain. It does not make you a drug addict. My advice to you is take that for a day, two at max, and then flush it down the commode because that stuff is powerful. But what he's saying here is he's saying, look, 
uh, Timothy is being very careful with his calling because you remember pastors elders and all that you you're not the bible says you don't need to drink you have a holy calling do not drink not that they could drink if they're not but he's saying be spite spite be very very careful not to drink to set it away in this daytime in this time of of of, of of history the water sources and even now even now in Israel and all were terrible they were awful and so they would have to find alternate things uh, when we were in Israel and also when we were in Mexico uh, they told us I remember we get off the plane they go don't drink anything that is not bottled only drink you know bottled stuff that has been purified and, and it's because the water source is still that bad and I remember reading about any, uh, any of you know Naaman he was a uh, um, a uh, commander in the, I think it was the Syrian army, and he was very powerful, but he was a leper. And it's so one of his um, hired hands told us, look, if you go to Israel, there's a man of God there that can heal you. And so he said, all right, I'm going to try it. And so he goes to Israel, uh, he goes to the king, the king says, I can't heal you, but here, I'm going to send you to Elijah. So he sends him to Elijah, uh, he knocks on the door, Elijah's um, assistant comes to the door and says, uh, Elijah says to go and go down and dip seven times in the Jordan River. And he shuts the door and it, oh, it ticks Naaman off. And Naaman's like, I am not going in that filthy river and wash. So see, you see how bad the source is. If he wouldn't just go in and dip in it, think about those that shouldn't be drinking it. Now let me tell you another thing I heard today. It was just funny. I was uh, listening to John Tesh. I was in the car for a long time today. Um, and he was saying that there was a new study out that says that if you wanted energy, that if you wanted to detox your body and stuff like that, you should eat the purple grapes, that they will give you energy, that they will detox your body. And I was thinking, that's exactly the reason that, Tim that Paul told Timothy to put that in his drink, because that juice, and it, not the alcohol now, I understand, not the fermented, but the juice will filter the water and make it okay. So he tells him not to go and start drinking every night, you know, with his dinner. He said, look, just put a little, his words, uh, not only drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. He could not go down to the Jerusalem uh, Walgreens and get something for his study, for his stomach. This is what it took because the water was so bad. And yet now everybody in churches, not this church, are drinking because of the scripture. And I just, my head just, go use common sense when you're reading it. It does not give him the authority to go out and drink and drink and drink. Well, I mean, the Bible is full of stuff talking about how bad it is, then how it'll take you down the wrong road and not to be drunk and all that. So just stay away from it. Just stay away from it. And if you have stomach ailments, go eat some grapes. Oh, I did want to read this. 1 Corinthians 6.12, this is Paul talking. He says, just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought could, I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. This is another scripture that they talk about. You know, Paul says everything is legal. And, you know, and again, I just want to go, oh my gosh. You know, it is perfectly legal to go over there and beat your head against the wall, but it is not beneficial to your body. Same principle. 24. That, by the way, was um, the message um, translation. Verse 24, some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment, but those, of some men, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Let me read another translation. The sins of some people are blatant and march them right into court. The sins of others don't show up until much later. The same with good deeds. Some you see right off, but none are hidden forever. In other words, he's just giving Timothy one more bit of advice. And so say, watch people. Let them prove their self. Don't let somebody walk into your church that you don't even know and put them ahead of the children's ministry. You don't even know anything about them. Those are important, important ministries. You, these people need to be, they need to be in the service. They need, you need to see their true identity before you put them in this, in, into power, into the ministry. Because this is all God's work. Amen? All right, let's do our questions real quick. 
I'm going to leave these right here. Are you? That's really good scripture. All right, let's do, I only did five. Uh, number one, complete verse 17. Let the elders who rule be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Uh, again, I, I want to encourage you to use your blue letter Bibles, to lose your, use your concordance, because all this, this all this is, is when you come across a, a, a scripture and you go, this doesn't totally, what does it mean double honor? Am I like to bow to them two times? No, you find out that this word that we use in a different way actually means something totally different. And so it's really important to research and, and to use it. And that Blue Letter Bible app is super easy, super easy. Uh, number two, true or false, 